All right, testing one, two, three. I do have some sound, so we're ready to go. I'm starting about 15 minutes earlier, and if I have anybody join me, I'll be surprised because campus is closed today. However, I want to go ahead and do the screencast uh, to have it there for you uh, because you do have work due at the end of, of, of the week. So uh, there really should be no issue in terms of you getting this stuff turned in. All right, and we've been working in advance anyway, so you, you should be good. Well, I'm going to go over here to the uh, modules in the course, okay? Let's take a look at that. And uh, we're here on the 19th, and today, of course, is the 21st. Now, on uh, tomorrow, uh, yeah, here, here we go, XLS 4 and 5, we've already uploaded those, so you're good. In fact, we, you should have uploaded everything now up to XLS 8. And as I told you, we're working on these cases and these Excel cases so that when we hit the access cases, if we need to stop and really slow down, we can. So we're banking some time there. Uh, so you should have uploaded this already. Same thing with the XLS4, same thing with XLS5. The one thing you do have is uh, on the 22nd, which is the few text, that's chapter, uh, the quiz over chapter five. And the 22nd is, of course, tomorrow. So you shouldn't have any problems uh, getting that done. Okay, now, we're going to be working today on case number, um, case number nine, which is Karma Digital. And I spoke with you some about it on, uh, on Monday. We talked about it. And in this case, this is a quality control case. And we're going to, to use uh, Microsoft Excel regression analysis, the regression analysis tool, to determine uh, the extent to which um, production and uh, two variables are linked together. And in this case, it's production and the percent of defects. And then we're going to try to do some prediction or forecasting uh, of how, uh, of what percentage of defects that we'll have if we continue at the rate where we're going. Now, page 81 starts us in the case, and on Monday I went over the question of, I went over the XY paradigm, and we talked about that where we compare, for example, you know, the temperature at game time versus the number of, uh, of, drink, uh, of drinks sold. Or we look at, you know, um, we, I, we talked about the, uh, how things correlate out there, for example, uh, interest rates versus stock prices, interest rates uh, versus, versus uh, the number of new homes built. And we talked about that. We talked about portfolios that look like an M because, they're, because they are cyclical versus those that are, uh, look like a W because they're counter cyclical. So we assume that there are things out in nature that tend to occur together. And we use the word correlate, co-relate, to signify that these two things occur together. Now, it's important to understand something. Correlation does not always mean causation. Just because two things occur at the same time, it doesn't mean that they're related, okay? It, give it a really kind of a crazy example. Let's say someone's driving in their car on a, out on I-40 during the Super Bowl, and Tom Brady throws a touchdown pass, and these people are not, you know, watching the Super Bowl and care, and they have a wreck. Well, there's a correlation between the time they had the wreck and the time that Tom Brady throws this <laughs> throws for a touchdown, but there's no causation. They don't have anything to do with the other. So we have to be careful when we, we make these assumptions, okay, about how variables relate, okay? And so that's one of the things with these tools, as I've said before, you want to make sure you don't try to polish your car with a hammer. But, we're, but when we have a fairly reasonable understanding uh, that two things are correlated, or in other words, that correlation also represents causation, Okay, then we're in good shape. Now I want to show you a couple of things. And I'm going to go first of all over to the files. And I think this is a very timely thing to take a look at. All right, and uh, you know we there there are there's tremendous tremendous discussion right now. Uh, it's going on in terms of um, uh, you know 
gun control, what people gun call gun control, gun regulation. And of course, you know, we keep seeing this just uh, sad and sickening uh, cycle of things that happen and, and shootings. And, you know, and so, uh, yeah, and today, uh, there, are, there are the high school students at the, at that, at the latest, since the latest high school, they've gone to their state legisl legislatures. I think they, they've gone to have a meeting with the president. On, on. I want to show you a, a, a chart that uses the X Y paradigm or, or or looks for it because sometimes we'll we'll when we work with two variables, we'll we'll try to see how they look. I want to show you something, and it's very well done. Okay, and I'm going to click on it. All right. And here is the here's the uh, this is a text file and this is the uh, the uh, URL the informed resource locator. I'll put it in here. And it's going to take us over here to the U.S. to the U.S. Uh, to the New York Times and they ask the question: What explains U.S. mass inter shootings? International comparisons suggest answer. Now, I like what they what they did here because they say it suggests an answer. It doesn't say it provides us an answer. And this is a this is a um, this is an article that appeared from uh, appeared back in 2017. But I want you to see because you're going to see an exceptionally well done X Y chart. Now on this on the on the Y axis of this chart, they show okay the number of mass shooters, okay, or mass shootings, okay, and then on the X axis, they show us how many guns. And they have these identified by country. So they're assuming that the number of guns or access to guns, what these authors are really probably are, are arguing is that the access to guns, particularly certain types of guns, and they're using the word gun to mean anything from you know a, a, a you know a, a simple. Um, sidearm you can purchase at Walmart all the way up to to one of these assault rifles okay and they're saying that access to them uh, which is reflected by the number of them up out there is related to mass shootings okay and uh, you know to a certain extent that's true I mean it, it, if you're gonna you know you can't you know you, you know you, it, it's it's absurd to believe a person can go in uh, you know, with, with a hammer or a knife and kill, you know, uh, and wound 500 people within 15 minutes, like the guy at Las Vegas. He even had a bone arrow take him, you know, how many days. So that's the issue is, okay, what they're saying, they're arguing, it's the number of guns or the availability of guns or particular type of guns, and then these things called bump stock. But I want to show you this. I'm not pushing one particular point or the other, so don't go away quoting me about this, because the authors say the, the, the comparison suggests an answer saying they're comparing countries, okay, we have them pegged here in terms of the mass shooting, mass shooters versus uh, the number of guns. And you can see they have uh, all these different countries, okay, and then of course here's the United States. Now, and, and this is an excellent, uh, excellent picture uh, and I don't think it'd be in the times if the data were inaccurate, but what is it that the data tell us? Well, they spend an article talking about that, okay? And there are moderating other thing, variables that come to play here, okay? But I wanted to show you one of these that looks quite good. Now I'll show you something else, uh, something that's maybe a, a little more happy to look at. And again, I'm not making, I was not making a point there, so don't take that or advocating a particular position. So don't take it. To mean that at all, I was not doing that. Okay, I'm showing you how these tools are used. Let's go out here, and I'm going to do a search real quick, quickly, for income versus educational attainment. Okay, and there's some nice, nice ones out there, and I'm going to look under images. Okay, and I want to show you one that I think is very well done, and then I'll show you another one here. This is an excellent visualization of data and what it shows you is the un they're showing you unemployment rate and earnings by educational uh, attainment 
And obviously, what these data suggest, look, they're almost mirror images of each other. They suggest that median uh, usual weekly earnings are far higher if you have a certain and the empl unemployment rate is far lower if you have the more education you get. Now, if you could see right here, okay, this shows you about what all workers make. So this shows you a median. See the line right there? All workers about $885 a week. That's the average um, earnings, about $40,000 a week. $40,000, $45,000 a year. And then here's the unemployment rate. And as you can see, all right, uh, and the higher, let's take a look over here, and you have the higher, the more education you have, okay, the, the, the lower the unemployment rate. The higher the education you have, okay, the more you earn. And when you get to a bachelor's degree, there's a real cutoff right here in terms of earnings. Now, there's some other uh, images here, and I want to find one for you, okay? And uh, look at here for just a second. And, oops, I'm sorry, I'll go back over here to the images. I was just kind of looking around today to see if I could find a line graph that shows us uh, that type of relationship. Here's the one I was looking for. Let's take a look at that. Uh, this is from um, I, the Tax Foundation. But what, it, what, they're, what they're arguing is that the, the income gap in the United States that everybody talks about this income inequality is based upon, okay, uh, an education gap. Well, let's look at this. So this uses an XY paradigm, okay, on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the X axis here, okay, we have how much money people make, their total income. This is from 2010. So I, I know this has changed, but you know, still, I want to show you this is a good example. And notice we have that on the y-axis, okay, the percent of people with a high school degree or less, the, the percent of people with a high school degree, uh, the percent, percent of people, okay, and the blue line shows those with a high school diploma or less, and the other shows them with a bachelor's degree, the red line. So this just shows you a percentage, and then here's income. And as you can see, uh, you know, about 78% of the people with a bachelor's degree or higher are uh, doing pretty good, pretty significant income. Only 9% of the people without a high school degree, with a high school degree or less, are in this area. So the odds that you're going to be making this kind of money if you finish high school or you don't finish high school are roughly about I would say, well, roughly about nine to one, okay? And so you can see, and, and the odds here are, 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 you know, they just flip. So it shows you that what, what, what I was talking about, you know, in terms of the XY, uh, that XY type of, of uh, analysis, okay? Well, that being said, we're gonna work with the data today, and so we're gonna go back over here and go into the files, all right? And we're going to come in and we're going to take a look at the Solvit 6.0 uh, student files. All right. And I'm going to click on there. I'm going to download it. All right. And as you'll see, uh, I've got these files and I want to get the Karma Digital file. And I'm going to open it up okay I'm going to click enable editing and then the file I'm going to click save as and I'm going to save it on my desktop remember I've got to do that because if I don't do it I won't put it in my native environment and I'll create a system file that I can't uh, that, that, that can't be up dealt with so I, I'm just going to call this uh, I'm going to call this case nine. In fact, I'm going to call this Excel. Pardon me. I'm going to call it Excel case nine Harmon. 
And I'm hoping that everybody has heeded that it's slick out there. As I sent you all an email this morning, I said I'm going to be doing the screencast, and if, if you can join me, fine, but you don't have to. But the labs at the university are probably going to be closed, so don't, don't try to get there. I'm going to click Save, all right? And I've done that. Now I'm going to close it. I'll close the zip file. Then I'm going to go down here. Uh, I'll close that off. I'll diminish that. That's from a recording. And I've got, uh, where's my file at? I'm going to have my, um, file. Let's see, there's part ink, that Hewlett heart. Okay. Here it is. Excel case nine Harmon. I'm going to open it back up. Okay. And let's now talk about this case. We're going to do a couple of things with it. All right. And we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna work on case. This is case number nine. It's over on page eighty-one in your textbook. And as I've said to you over and over and over, you will not get anything out of these cases, or you won't get as much as you could get if you don't have the case. If you don't have your book with you as we go through these. All right. So we're gonna look at this. And here in the skeleton file, let's look at what we have to start with. Here's the title. Okay, and every, every well-designed spreadsheet has the following things. Here's the title, and then we have the documentation, who, who, the author, the name of the file, that type of thing. And then we have the input, pardon me, the uh, computation and output area. Okay, and we're going to spiff that up a, a little bit later to make it look a little bit nicer. But for now, we're going to do a little bit of work with the data. Now, on page 81, they tell us about the company, okay? And they make DVDs. And one of the things they've been doing uh, is they've been tracking their production volume year by year. And here we see from 1999 to 2008, the production volume and then the percent defective, okay? Now, as they know, a zero percent defective is, is impossible but you don't want to, you want to minimize this number. And I'm going to show you this, for example. The percent defective, 1.5% doesn't, 1, 1 doesn't sound like a lot. But let's do this. Let's take equal, okay, and, the product, and that's B10, uh, times, okay, 0 0.015. And that's... 1.5%, and let's see what that gives us. And that's 45,000 defective. On a volume of, of, 40, of 3 million, that means 45,000 of these are defective. Okay? And we took uh, B10 times 0 0.015, which is 1.5%, and we get 45,000. Now, if the company loses, $5, uh, let's say the company, for every time they have a defective uh, DVD, the company loses, let's call it a dollar and nine cents. Let's figure out how much they've lost. They just lost $49,000 because they sold junk to somebody. Not only did they lose money on, uh, and I, I'm going to say I'll include in the dollar and nine cents uh, what it costs to make it, what it costs to send it, and then what it costs to have them send it back to you. And plus, I haven't even figured in the, the, the ill will that you create, okay, and, and, and a customer that you may lose. So this is serious. Uh, this is a serious issue. Quality control is absolutely important. So, uh, and, and again, this is like the product pricing. Uh, it's sad to me that we don't make you take a course on quality control because it's just as important in the service and industries as it is in manufacturing. Service events, okay, are subject to a lot of the same kinds of things are subject to in terms of, of manufacturing or, or producing things. Well, we've got these percent defectives, and let's just look at the data for a second. We're going to do a very, very preliminary kind of uh, uh, analysis, 
all right? And I'm, and I'm going to make sure, first of all, that I have the data. Now I have them by the year, which makes sense, and then I have the production volume each year. I'm going to put my cursor on uh, B, uh, what is that? B3 or whatever it is. Oh, I, it'll tell me up there, B10. Okay, I'm going to take it from B10 down to uh, uh, B, I think it's B19. Okay, there I can see it. Yeah, and I'm going to come over here to the conditional formatting and, and I'm going to use the gradient fill on the data bars. Let's look at that for a minute. And if I were to flip that around, what we would see is the production volume is going up every year. Okay? That's why I love these tools because it visualizes for us what's happening. It's obvious. Um, their production volume is going up every year. Let's look at the percent defective. And then again, I'm going to put my cursor this time on C10, and I'm going to go all the way down to C19. I'm going to come over here and look at conditional formatting. I'm going to do the, the uh, data bars and on the gradient fill. Yeah, in fact, let me do something for a minute. I'm going to come back over here and do the gradient fill. And instead of a blue on the data bars, I'm going to do a nice green. You know where I'm headed with this, don't you? Yep, green and gold, the old school colors. So let's do that. Green, okay, and then the percent defective, gold, and we'll use the conditional formatting for that. The data bars, gradient fill. Now I like the gradient fill as opposed to the solid fill because I can still see the numbers in here. And let's look at this, notice something. The percent defective is increasing. Over time, it's trending upwards. It's not a steady climb, but it is trending upwards. So what it looks like right now is the more we more more DVDs we make, the more junk we make. That's not a good thing. That's a prescription for problems. So we've got to figure out first of all, you know, are how how much of these two things related, and then if we continue doing business as usual, where might we end up? Now there could be any one of a number of issues that are creating this or causing this. Something has gone wrong in the quality control. Okay? And so we're, we want to know that, but we've got to first have to establish the fact that indeed, and I just showed you, the, you know, what, what one half percent of three million looks like. So you can only imagine what 4.6 of 13 million looks like. And if you want to see it, Let's do this. I'm going to come down here and I'm going to put in cell D19. I'm going to put equal. B19, that's the raw number, times um, C19. And that will give me, and then times, uh, let's see. I, I don't want to do C19 because it's going to give me four points. So B19 times zero. 0.046, yeah, there we go, times, I think we're saying a dollar nine, 1.09. And I'll put a, when I'm making 13 million of these things, if 4.6% of them are bad, I'm eating $652,000 a year. That is a significant burden for me. And probably what's happening is I'm producing myself out of existence. Okay, so let's talk about this for a minute. I'm gonna go back in, let's get rid of all the fill there. We don't need it. So we'll uh, go clear the rules on this, clear rules from selected cells and they're gone. Now, as we look over here in the text, as we look in the case on page 82, they talk about what they call simple regression versus multiple regression. Simple uh, regression is when I take one variable versus another. 
multiple regression, which is beyond this course, talks about multiple factors. And that's what I just got, I showed you the thing about the shootings. And I said, you know, there's some other variables included here. Okay. And, and there, are, there are, you just can't explain it by the number of guns. Okay. You, you, you have to look at a whole set of factors and, and people are really serious. People are, are really taking a look at that, trying to figure out, you know, what's going on and, and trying to compare. Now, one of the difficulties of this is that we live in an age of social media and an age of 24 hour a day news. And anything like this gets picked up and boom, it's all over. It's on the internet. It's in people's minds. One of the, here's an interesting factoid. The worst mass killing or homicide in any school in the United States happened back uh, at the turn of the 20th century in a, in a, in the, in a school in a city called, in a town called Bath, Michigan. And, uh, and a man who was on the school board who was deranged, um, but drove a truck full of explosives up, up, to the, up to the school and set it off. And it killed, I think it was 122 people. Okay, so there, there's nothing new about this. And we've had, and, and we back, uh, when I was a young person, there was a man named Charles Whitman who climbed up into the highest, uh, into the tower at the University of Texas and killed a bunch of people. So, you know, it's just not the availability of guns, but again, yeah, you know, that's why you'd use multiple regression in a really serious study to try to figure out, and then they'll do some things. But sometimes these are things called multiple regression will let you figure out uh, how strong the relation, how strong the variable interest is, say mass shootings, with other factors. Which ones seem to be the most powerful? Okay, well we're just going to do a simple regression here. Now let me stop for a minute. And also say, yeah, you know, this can also apply to things like home sales, we know that there is a strong correlation between interest rates and new home sales, okay? Or housing starts. When the interest rates are low, housing starts are, are, are increasing. When interest rates increase, housing starts decrease. But there are some other things that get impinged in that. So if you were to talk about, you know, um, it, 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 there are some other factors, just an interest rate. You also have to look at, you know, income level, all right, and, and, and housing stock. And there are just all kinds of, of, of things that get mixed up in that. But we're just going to look at this, 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 this instance, and, you know, um, it's clear that the more we make, if we don't do something different with our production process, we're really going to be in trouble. So we're going to we're going to do we're, we're going to we're going to do a little bit of analysis. Now we did a first analysis using the conditional formatting. We can see that the the they're both trending upwards, the percent defective in production volume. So they're both headed upwards. Now if we look in the textbook, okay, uh, they're going to they give you some information about the independent versus the dependent variable, and I'm going to talk with you for a moment about that. The dependent variable is known as the variable of interest. It's what I'm in, what I'm studying. Okay, if I had a chart that showed the GDP of the United States from 1950 to 2018. Okay, I'm going to have a y-axis on that chart, and then I'm going to have those data points year by year of GDP. Well, am I interested in the years? No, I'm interested in the dependent variable. The variable of interest is what? GDP. So in this case, our variable of interest or our dependent variable, and that, and that term sounds a little counterintuitive, intuitive, I understand. Sound is percent effective. The independent variable, okay, is the production volume, okay? Because look, I could, instead of production volume, I could say sales volume. We don't know how, many, how much of this stuff they sell. We just know this is how much they make. Now let's hope that <laughs> of all the stuff they make, they don't ship any junk. They have a way to catch it. Well, then that's not going to do them a lot of good anyway, because, you know, if I've got orders to fill and I'm losing 45,000, I don't have that to sell. Nonetheless, 
The dependent variable zone is a variable interest, and in this case, it's the percent defective, and it would be it would be tracked, it, it would be reflected, its scale would be on the y-axis, and then the, the independent variable would be on the x-axis. Okay? And uh, you know, and uh, you know, what you might want to do is also, uh, you, you know, this is based on using a Cartesian plane. Okay. Oh, it sounds like geometry again. And here's here's a fun factoid: the x-axis is the horizontal axis. It's also known as the abscissa. Okay. So make your you can make yourself a t-shirt and, and that says "How's your abscissa today?" and you can become like a cool person there at school. Or the Y axis is the ordinate, okay? Well, we're gonna take a look at these data here, okay? And before we, before we do the regression analysis, we're gonna do one more analysis and just kind of try to, to uh, take a stab at it. So I'm gonna come up here and click Insert, okay? And I'm gonna come, I'm gonna come over here to the charts, I'm gonna click Scatter, and I'm going to choose this very first scatter with markers. Okay? And isn't that pretty? It automatically gave me, okay, a scatter diagram of the production volume, okay, and the percent defective. Now, what I want to do, and I, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to cut this chart because I don't like it. I'm going to click insert, okay, and then insert chart, and then I'm going to go to, uh, um, let's see, I'm going to click on the insert, and then I'm going to go to the scatter diagram. I want, I'm hoping I can avoid that silliness. Let's see, I'm, I'm going to do this because I've got it, things are upside down. So I'm gonna click on select data, okay? And I'm in the select data source dialog box, production volume, okay? I'm gonna remove it. Percent defective, I'm gonna remove it and I'm gonna start over, okay? And I'm gonna start with the Y axis. I'm gonna click add and the series name is gonna be percent defective, okay? And the X values will be the production volume. Okay? And the Y values will be percent defective. And I'll click okay. All right? Now, I've got these labels, I've got them, I'll click OK, and here we are, okay? Now, I have a nice scattergram that shows me the intersection of these, okay? And that's not too bad. Now, I can go on chart layouts, I can click on that or that, you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, so I'm gonna cut that because I don't wanna keep it. And let's see, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try one other thing here. I click insert and let me see here. I'm gonna get, uh, I wanna get my, We'll come back over here to the scatter and I'm gonna click all chart types. And I can select, as you as you recall, okay, I, will, I can do an XY scattergram. I'll click okay. And it's gonna say, okay, now select the data. Okay. And I'm gonna add the legend series and that will be uh, the series name will be, again, the uh, percent defective, and we're probably going to end up with the Y. And we're just playing with this. 
And here are the series X values. Okay. And those X values are going to be production volume. And the Y values will be the percent defective. Okay. So we're not getting the, the really the true scatter effect that we want, but as you can see, they're moving up. Well, I'm gonna cut that out of there, okay? Now I'm ready to do the, uh, I'm ready to do the regression. Now, click on the data tab on Excel. Look over here to analysis. If you don't see data analysis tools, you're gonna to have to add it into Excel. If you do this on your own machine, it should be pretty easy to do. If you work in the lab, you should be able to do that once you've accessed the VMware and all that. I'll just show you, I'm gonna click a file. I'm gonna click options. I'm gonna click add-ins. Now, if the analysis tool pack Okay, if it's, if, it's, uh, if it's inactive, click on it so that it becomes active. Now I have a thing called the Analysis Tool Pack VBA. I'm gonna click that and click Go. And it's gonna give me this add-ins menu. And I've added in the Analysis Tool Pack, Euro currency, and the solver add-in. So I'm, I'm, I'm good, okay? Now, I'm going to click on the data analysis over here and see what I have. And I have a, Excel provides us in a very, very impressive array of statistical uh, tools that we can use. And when you take stat, hopefully you'll learn why you'd use any one of these or all of them. Okay, so we're, we're good to go. So now, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to start with this, all right, and... I'm going to start by coming over here to the right of the data, and I'm going to put the uh, regression line. I'll type that in here. Okay. Now, the regression line is is based on the idea, okay, of the equation of a line, and you know that that's y equals mx plus b. And uh, Y is the intercept, okay? MX is the slope, and B is some variable you're looking at, okay? And the slope, as we talked about, is the rise over the run, the change in those, okay? And the, uh, the, the authors talk some about that, and, and for now, just, uh, just assume that, that we're going to do this. Imagine I have a, I have a, uh, I have a, 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 vert, a vertical line. Okay, I have, I have a chart. The, I have the vertical line. Okay, and then I have the horizontal line, and then I have a perfect line coming out of the corner. That's called the regression line. It's known as the line of best fit. So if two variables tend to occur together out in time. And remember, there's that PowerPoint I gave you about the XY relationship that showed the positive correlation, a negative correlation, and no correlation. You remember just a while ago when we threw up that little simple scattergram, okay, that what we saw was that the higher the production, the more defects we got. Okay, and, we, and we've seen that already when we did the conditional formatting. So we said, okay, let's see exactly how strong that correlation is. So I'm, I'm going to, to the right, I'm going to put the regression line, okay? Now, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to use the regression line tool. I'm going to click data analysis. I'm going to come over here, click regression, and I'll click OK. And it's going to say, all right, this is the nice thing about Excel. The statistical tools in here, the dialog box, these are all very, very, they really minimize your, really you don't do any computation. Excel assumes if you understand what you're putting in there, you don't have to do all the math. It will do the math for you. The input for the Y range, okay, and 
I'm going to put, and first of all, I'm going to put labels. And the input for the Y range will be the percent defective. Okay. And then the X range, I'm going to come over here and get the production volume. All right, and then I have uh, a confidence level. I'll click that, 95% confidence level. That's pretty standard. And do we want it in this worksheet or in a new worksheet? Okay, let's, and, then, and let's come down here and, and say we want the residuals. And we'll see what that's all about here in a minute. And I'm gonna click output range. And I'm going to choose my out range, output range over here. And then I'm going to click OK and let's see what happens. And see, I have my residuals. OK, I want the line fit plots as well. Make sure I click that and I'll click OK. And there we are. Now we get some summary output, output from, uh, from Excel. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my cursor and click home i'm going to make it bold maybe increase it in size to 12 so i can see it and i'll do that with residual output as well bold 12 okay and then i'm going to come over here and i see the production volume line fit plot now i'm going to take the end of this and chart and I'm gonna stretch it out so I can see. Now notice something. Here's the predicted percent defective and here's the actual. So we're saying okay what did we actually get versus what we would get given a straight line. Now I'm gonna click here and I'm gonna say add, add the trend line. Okay and I'm gonna choose a linear trend line. And I want to set the, uh, I can set the intercept to zero, display the equation on the chart. There's our equation for the line, and then display R squared. I move these two over here. Now this line, and I'm going to format the trend line. And what I'm going to do with it is on the line, Style on something a little thicker, and so I'm going to make it more points. Says so I hit the points, I click close. Now, isn't that nice? Now I can. I'm going to pull this out for just a minute, and now I have. Uh, let me do the the. Uh, I'm navigating this around and it shows me the production volume. Okay. And to, now to get the full thing, all right, I'm going to need to take that chart and really stretch it out. So there's some maneuvering to do here. Now this has given me, um, let me, let me go down here. There we go. Now, is, this is just going to take a little bit of maneuvering here with these. Now, notice that we have the percent defective. That's the actual. That's the blue. Then we have the predicted percent defective. That's in the red. And I can take my uh, cursor and, and I'll get a pop out when I hover it. And this says the predicted percent defective at 6 million. Uh, I'm predicting 2.65, okay? Well, I'm going to come back up here to the actual, and at 6 million, the actual is 3.1. Here's the percent defective. Here's the production volume, okay? Now, there's some other data over here. We're going to look at it in just a minute. I'm going to put my cursor on K, and I've got the intercept and the production volume, and we'll use those in just a minute. Well, I wanna look at this, and I wanna start by, and you know, this is pretty self-evident. And so we have this line of best fit. Think of this 
uh, uh, think of this as a, this is a line that if the two were perfectly correlated, or the, this is what we'd get. Okay, and here's the ag percent. It's actual versus the predicted. Now, when you look up here, so cat, this is this looks familiar. This is the line of best fit. Yeah, the formula for a line. And then we have this thing called R squared. R squared is the correlation squared. You say, why is this important? The R squared or the correlation squared explains to me, okay, how much of the variation or differences or the distance from this line of best fit to out here is explained by the comparison. And about it's about 67%. So that's pretty high. So I can see, yeah, well, yeah, they, they trend together. I've got an outlier here, and I've got an out, you know, I've got, but but notice we're we're clustered here on this line. Okay. Now we can compute the regression line, okay, by by using a, a pretty simple, a, a pretty simple uh, uh, exercise. And if you look there at at uh, over on page 83, uh, they taught, and this is in the middle, it says to the right of your data, create a column for the regression line. Calculate the regression line as follows. Multiply the value of the X variable one, also known as production volume. Well, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna click on that cell, okay? And I'm gonna click uh, formulas, and I'm gonna define the name, and it will say production volume, Boom, and I've got that name created. Now, um, and and then I, I'm going to, uh, also I want to get the, uh, the intercept, and so I'm going to click there on that cell, which is L18, and I'm going to define the name, the intercept. Now I'm ready to do some work with these. And so I'm gonna put here equal, and then I'm gonna use the formula, the production volume, okay? And, uh, and that's gonna be times the uh, value of the independent variable, that's the pieces produced or production volume. And just to be safe, I'm gonna put a dollar sign in front of the B10, okay? And those, uh, and then I'm gonna add the constant, and that's, uh, and I'm gonna put this in parentheses. And then it will be plus, uh, and I'm going to add the uh, add the value of the constant, the intercept. And so I'm going to click insert uh, using formula intercept, and I get the regression line. Now, since I've used the B10 and I'm using the name manager and all this, I should be able just to scroll down, okay, and get the regression line. And what this does is this shows me the projections, the, the regression line itself that shows me that line of best fit. Now, if you come down here, you can take a look for a moment, and you're going to see this thing called residual output. And I'm going to put my cursor right here on these three cells here. I click home, and I'm going to make them, I'm going to bold them up. And it, down here in the residual output, Here's the observation, and that's the first one, second one, all the tenth one. This shows me the predicted percent defective, which is 1.877 blah, 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 which is, and I'm gonna go ahead and, and just take those down to two decimals, okay? So I'll decrease the decimals. Okay, and I want to switch that out. These and the residual, 
The residual is the difference, okay? Now I'm gonna go ahead and, and, and take, take these all down to two, 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 uh, two digits, two, 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 excuse me. <laughs> okay, now I want you to notice something. The actual was 1.5 and percent defective. This is in 1999. And uh, yeah, we'll make, uh, just to make this simpler, I'm gonna blank those out. And I'm gonna come over here and I'm copy those years. But I want to show you so you really can see it in terms of now. Here we are, the 1999 observation. Okay. I predicted I we would have 1.88% defectives. We had 1.5, so that's a residual, the difference. That's all they're talking about. And they're just showing us here in a chart what you can see over, uh, pardon me, in a table, what I can see over here in a chart. Okay, so I've charted that. The key piece of this is the R, the R square, which says that 60% of the variation i.e. the residual, okay, uh, is accounted for by 66% 6 of the variation is accounted for by, or yeah, 60%, let me stop for a minute, correlation, R squared is correlation squared, so 67% of the, uh, uh, the association between these two, okay, is based upon the um, is based upon the comparison, and you can see, um, you know, over time. And let's just take the regression line. I'm I'm gonna I'm just gonna do a conditional format and look at it. Let me use some gradient fill and look what happens. Now. This is pretty typical, okay? Well, yeah, no, I don't wanna do that. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna come down to the residuals and take a look at them. We, we're all, and you say, why are you fuss budgeting so much with the residuals? Because the residuals, okay, tell me how far this is off, okay? and. Um, you know, we'll do that down here. I'm gonna come down to the residuals. I'm gonna highlight them. And again, remember the residual is the predicted value minus the, the actual value. And I'm gonna do the, the conditional formatting. I use the gradient fill on these. And I'm gonna stay true to my school. And let's go to the patriotic thing. Now watch. If it's if the if the uh, if the percent if the actual percent is lower than the regression line or what we forecasted using that line of best fit, we get a red. If it's greater than, we get a blue line. And notice how this kind of it's it kind of swirls around. This table and that conditional formatting there pretty much depicts what you see over here. Notice how they kind of hug together. Then we have a couple of outliers. You say, okay, that's pretty cool. And so I can say, yeah, these two things are related. I have a production problem, okay, and I need to check it. Now, it could be incoming stuff. In other words, people sending me junk and then I'm just inadvertently passing it on. Or it may be something I'm doing, okay? But I want to make, establish the fact that something, uh, you know, that, that this is not acceptable, okay? You're never going to have a zero, you know, you're never going to end up with zero um, defectives. But you want to get as down as far as you can. In fact, your industry 
uh, if you make a product like a, like a DVD or you make anything, you should have, you, you should pretty much know what industry standards are in terms of, of percent effective. Okay, well that being said, then the question is, okay, if I can, if I can do this and I've got this production line fit plot, can I can I use this to predict how things might be if I continue to go forward? Well, you know, it doesn't take a genius to say if I keep making more stuff and the percent defective goes higher, uh, you know, then I'm uh, I'm 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 pretty stupid. Okay, <laughs> that's the only words to use for it. But we want to use we can use this re residual to show us, or we can use the the uh, the uh, the production line fit plot to see this, okay? Now let's say for example, I okay I have two more years and I put 2009, okay? And in 2009 I'm going to make 15 million pieces, okay? Now um, and let's go ahead and make that look pretty so I get it lined up there. Okay, and I want to know the percent defective, and I'll just scroll this on down. Okay, and, and let's see. Now, I'm making a forecast. Now, let me, let's do this for just so we don't get fooled, because this is one of these parts in the case where people can get very uh, confused. I'm going to put there in D9 actual percent defective and I'm gonna make that in the middle so it looks nice okay now I'm gonna carve this up just a hair scroll this down a bit there we go now uh, I've got regression line I'm putting parenthesis predicted percent defective now it's now it's much much clearer, isn't that nice? Much better. And I'm gonna wrap the text there, okay? And then I'll just go ahead. And now I I don't have actual figures, but I'm gonna uh, you know let's see, it's like that 15 million put it in the middle. And I, I now you say why are you starting here? Well, I don't have an actual figure because. 2009 hasn't happened in this case, so I'm going to scrunch it down here, and it says, okay, 4.90. And let's click on that for a moment. And notice the cells will go hot. And so I've got 4.90. And then for 2010, I'm going to make 20,000. And I'll make that middle. Oops, I got a little too, too many zeros there. There we go. Now I'll put that in the middle. Now here's what it's saying, all right? If I continue operating like I am, I can use the regression line, okay, to make predictions. And notice here's a predicted percent defective. Okay. And if I did the, and I don't have the residuals down there for 2009, 2010, but we could do it for the whole thing. But we know now, if at 15 million, uh, it's saying, well, you'll stay at about 4.9% defective. That's what it predicts. But look what happens when I go to 20 million. Boom, it pops all the way up to 6.16% defective. Not good. Not good at all. So this tells me if I keep, things don't look good. Now we've done all of the tasks, 
that they've asked us to do. Okay, we even did the scatter diagram and all that business. Okay, and uh, you know, I I prefer us to stay over here and use this line fit plot. Okay, and again, I'm I'm going to stretch this dude out, make it bigger so we can really see what we're looking at, okay? If I want to, I can also format these with data callouts, but I can hover my, my uh, cursor there and see the same thing. And it gives us production volumes and increments of uh, 5 million, which is fine. There's a point where we would clutter this chart up and it's gonna look nasty. Okay? So at this stage of the game, I know I, 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 I've got, um, I know that if I keep going the rate I'm going, okay, I'm going to be up to 6% you know, of this stuff. He said, well, Dr. Hart, let's say, let's just predict it out a few more years and see what happens. Okay, we can do that. So we'll put 2011, and let's say that in 2011, we'll make that look nice, okay? Uh, we're going to make, uh, we're going to jump it to, instead of five, an increment of 5 million, we'll make it 22,500,000. And then I'll just drag and drop this down. And here we are. And says, okay, you're, you're going to be at 6.79%. Now, I want you to notice something for just a minute. I'm going to highlight these figures, and let's look at something. Again, we always want to look at the residuals. Now, on, these, on, the, on the predicted right here for 2009, it kind of, it's about half a percent. And then, wow, it jumps to 6%, and now we're almost at 7%. And so what this is saying is, this is, it, this is a real problem you have because the more you make, the, the, the greater that, that the, the higher this is gonna start to become. It's, it, 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 you have, you're gonna have these, you're gonna have way more than what you wanna bargain with, okay? Now, uh, we don't have actual percent for you these years because these are forecasted. But that's, uh, you know, that's pretty much where we're at. And, you know, we let, we let uh, Excel go ahead and create the line chart for us, the production and volume line fit plot, and a nicely done percent effective production volume. Okay, and we've got increments of, 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 of uh, five, five million. We've got the, and we have a nice legend over here. Okay. And uh, here's the defective, the linear uh, defective line plot. Okay. And so we can say, woo. Okay. Now, again, remember, we don't know the actual production volume. A per actual percent defective because we're just you know these are forecasts out here of what we think we'll make okay you say why can't I just guess why well, guess when the machine will give you that guess and you know let's try something let's make a 2012 okay and let's say that year, I'm going to make that straight. Um, we're going to make, that year we'll make 25 million. Okay. And, and then we'll, we'll go ahead and put that in there. And now we're going to drag and drop. And, and notice this. See, here we had a draw. Here we had a jump of... Uh, about six tenths of a percent. That's uh, 0.63 percent. Here, it's about the same, 0.63 percent in terms of, of a residual, uh, in terms of the change year to year. 
So we're seeing that kind of we're we're seeing it kind of flatten out. Okay, and and this is something called the regression to the mean, where over time th things kind of tend to to go back to average. One of the reasons, for example, a team, let's say the Kansas City Royals or or, or some team that goes to the World Series, and then the next year they don't. And the reason is, is because they got to the World Series that year and won it and all this because somebody, two or three people had a career year, and there were a lot of scheduling and all kinds of things just kind of fell in place. Okay? Baseball, I, in my opinion, maybe basketball, but baseball is certainly, I think, the, the truest of, of the world champion teams because you play about six or seven months. You play in the cold of the spring. Okay, you play in the extreme heat of summer. Then you go back to the cooling off of fall. And by the time you get to the World Series now, we're into November. So you're back playing in football weather. You've played 162 regular season games, 81 of which you've traveled. Then if you go through the playoffs, I think it's, uh, I, I guess it's a best of three and a best of, I think it's a best of five. If you have a playoff, you, you, there's that first playoff game. And then I think that's, it's a best of, of five and then a best of seven and a best of seven. I'd have to go back and look at it. By the time you play 172 games or something and you've been going, uh, you know, you figure out a lot of it's attrition. And, and so you, you find out really who is the best team because they, you know, baseball seasons are marathons, not sprints. Okay. When you get to the playoff, you're kind of sprint. But up to that point, it's a, it, 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 it's, a, it's a marathon for sure. But you can see it kind of flattened out. And if you look here, let's notice something. If you look at this year versus the, versus the next one, like on these predictions, you can see that's about 0.30. This is uh, the – and then, then to, this is about a 0.18. This is about a 0.08. Then we're back to a 0.18. Then now we're looking at a point, uh, that would be 34.7 in terms of change. And this is a 0.51. Now I have a 0.13. I'm comparing this this year versus that. And then this is 0.19. Then we have 0.15. Now we jump back up to a 0.5. And then we really take a massive jump, and, and, and you can see. So we always, you know, we can compute the difference, differences in the prediction, and 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 start to 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 see. But we'll see that that regression of the mean, that winding. But there is an explanation for these. Okay. So that's pretty much it as far as this, you know, is doing the computation work. And we're going to do some things kind of pretty. And then I want to talk a little bit about the summary uh, output. So we let's go ahead and put your cursor on A9 over to D9 as I have it here. And I'm going to put in some nice fill. I'm going to get a nice blue. Okay. And I'm going to put a, uh, you know, I carried this out to 2012, and I'm going to go ahead and put a nice ribbon there. And then I'm going to come in here and put all borders, just to make it look nicer. Okay, see? And uh, now we have all that data, and, you know, and if I wanted to, I could add a column over here for the, the, what we would call the, we have the residual percent, and we can look at the differences in. I want to talk about these for a minute over here in the summary output. This is something about um, about uh, about Excel that makes it such a fantastic tool. First of all, it gives us the regression statistics. Now it's telling us over here, okay, that it's zero point nine four. Okay, and uh, that's on a multiple regression. 
Now this is pretty, uh, this is pretty large. And what it's saying is the, 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 the correlation between these two variables, percent effective and production, is so strong, okay, that if I were running a multiple R, I had multiple factors, I'd have this. So these two really account for a lot of variance. Then here's the R square and the adjusted R square. These are very, very high, okay? So indeed, production and percent defective is closely linked. And you say, well, you know what? That's kind of, it. we spend a lot of time figuring out what any idiot could figure out because the more stuff I make, the greater the percent, and the percent, and the greater the percentage of uh, defects. Well, we would assume that, okay? But what, would it, what we might assume instead would be, no matter how much we make, a certain percent of it. But we see more, the more stuff made, the more the actual percent defective increases. If, just, if we just kept saying, uh, you know, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, you know, we're, we're good, but it's growing. So, so there's something that's happening as we handle more and more stuff. So we would want to go and look at, look at our production uh, processes. We'd want to look at the stuff that comes in the door, all kinds of things. Okay. And we've done the, uh, we've done the, We've done the, the business as far as, you know, we've, we've got a, we, we did better than this. We did a scatter chart, but we did better than that. We did the line fit, fit plot. Okay. This is the one I'm always want to be interested in because it tells me the most. And I can see that my predictions, here's an outlier, here's an outlier, okay. And this is pretty close. This is pretty. So you can see we're rocking along here. And then boom. And on this one, it's interesting. The predicted percent for the defective uh, 4,900,000. Let's go here for a minute. And we look at 4,900,000. And they're about as close as they can. These are the two that are the closest. That's why uh, if I really took this here, okay, and I really enlarged it, you'd see that blue one start to emerge. In fact, I'm just going to do that. You can see that blue one's kind of hidden under there. That's when they're that, at, at that, they're so close together. Okay, well now that is the case, and we can see we see the residuals here. They're big, I mean they're fairly small, and boom. Now, one of the things I would also finally look at is this. I keep seeing this phenomenon where the predicted figure is larger than the actual figure except for two cases right here in this in this period of time and let's look at this for a minute in these two years 2002 and and 2003 okay the actual percent defective is bigger than what we predicted, okay? And we see that reflected down in the, res in the observations, the residuals, and so we did a little bit of work with that. Now they've also given us some output in terms of uh, an analysis of variance. That's really kind of beyond what we're after here. But we know now that we have you know, a problem and we need to do something with it and to do something with it pretty fast. Okay, so that you know, is Excel case number nine. Okay, and I'm gonna put it on the desktop
uh, close it off. And then I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to come over here in the files, and I'm going to upload it. And let me find it here. D -d 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 -d. In fact, I'm going to do this. Excel case nine, Harmon. I'll add that up. And see if it's going to upload for me. Doesn't act like it wants to. Let me go back down here for a minute. See if we can find Harmon in here. I'll pop down here. Huh. That's odd. Let me try one more time. And maybe I need, let me, let's see if I. Redo this, and I'll find uh, what was the name Harmon Excel Excel Case Nine. Up. Sometimes. This is a little weird and it just simply will not let me upload, or maybe I'm not seeing that it's been uploaded. Okay. Let's see all my files, I'll do that. Maybe it'll be in here. Nope, that's not working. <laughs> So I'm going to try to upload it again here. I don't know why I'm getting this weirdness. Um, so case nine. And usually it'll show you that it's being uploaded. Well, okay. Maybe I have a, maybe I have loaded it. No, it's not showing it as being loaded. So that's a disappointment. Well, okay, folks. Um, that's pretty much it. And you'll, you know, um, and if you want, you've seen how I've done this. And if you want to, to upload for nine, you're always welcome to do this one. This is XLS9. It's a solution file. Okay, you, you, and you're very welcome to use it or to use this X, XLS 9 uh, Spring 15. Either one of those is fine. You can upload them. And hopefully I can get the one I just got through doing uh, uploaded. But if not, that's life. Okay, now let's go back over here to the modules and let's talk about what's, what's always ahead. And again, just to remind you, Okay, um, this week, I'll just do this uh, control F, and this is week four. And I don't know what I just did there, but I said bye bye to. Uh, now we go back here for the search, go into Canvas. I hadn't logged out, so it should just put me right back in. And this is the Monday, Wednesday class. So this is business problem analysis B. Okay. And here we go down to the modules. And I'm going to click this welcome thing back up. And we'll go down here to week. Three, excuse me. 
And here we are, XLS four and five, you should have already done and had them uploaded. The, uh, the, the quiz over the Stephen Few text, show me the, uh, show me the numbers is, is on the 23rd. Okay. And as you go on down here a uh, week, as we go to week four, you'll see that we're going to have in week four. All right. You're going to have exam one. Okay, now exam one is going to be over materials that are here in the uh, that are here in the in the canvas room as well as some, drawn from some of your textbook. I it, it's all the material for it is here, and I even have a sample exam one for you to take a look at, and then an exam one part two. And I have uh, uploaded your work here, and I even and I give you some detailed instructions on what to do for exam one part two. So it's two parts, kind of a kind of, kind of an objective part, and then this is kind of a hands-on part, and that'll be coming up. Those will be due on March first, and then XLS six, which you should have done already. Okay, now we are going to be we've we've done uh we've done case number nine which was karma digital and again i would always remind you after the case is done in the text the authors will have an excel tutorial for example the excel tutorial for spreadsheet case nine is there starts on page 84. we're gonna work on uh, um uh, next Monday, we're going to be working on spreadsheet case number 10. Now, I want to let you, you know, I'm going to be sending everybody an email, okay? Because on Monday, I've got a, a medical appointment. I have a, a colleague whose class I need to observe. So what I'm going to do for next Monday, as I will also do for my management science class uh, that, that meets at 11, is I will have a pre-record. I will have a pre-recording for you. In other words, I'll go through a, a screencast, save it, and have it there for you as pre-recorded to take a look at. Because that day I just can't get to my doctor's appointment and then get to class, and then um, the time the course I'm going to observe for my colleague also meets at two o'clock. So I'll I'll post the stuff. Okay, uh, and you'll have it to take a look at. And on Monday, I will uh, in, in I'll, I will start with the uh, case number ten, and that's Blue Sky Computer Services over on page eighty-eight. Okay, well that's going to pretty much do it. And I think we've uh, we we've, we've learned a lot here, done some work, and uh, learned a little bit about uh, linear. Uh, pardon me about uh, um, we've learned a little bit about. Um, regression and how we compare variables against each other to see if we can find relationships between them and uh, and a good little case dealing with some, uh, the question of quality control all righty well folks that will do it and stay safe and be careful hopefully uh, this is Wednesday the 21st they'll have uh, maybe the roads will be good on Thursday uh, if not, I'm going to end up having to do some uh, screencasts, but I might have those set already. Don't forget that I have uh, office hours, I think that should have started a while ago, and that will go till 5.30. Let me look at the announcements. Okay. Uh, now we'll go at 3.30. Okay, folks. So today is the 21st, so at 3.30 I'll have an office, virtual office hours. All right, well, I'm going to end this, uh, stop sharing it, and start the recording and get it set to go. Thanks a lot and have a good one.